Hi, welcome to Bernie Night Chat episode 87. This week, we're going to start our economic lecture series as I explained, I think back in July, possibly, yeah, that we are, we are doing a bunch of economic uh, lecture series. So this is the very first one for this week. And then we do Q&A, and then we got a, a farewell from the intern and a welcome to a new intern. Monday Night Chat with Wong Chen. Brought to you by the Member of Parliament for Subang. Okay, this is a Monday Night Chat version for the Economic Lecture Series Part 1. In this Part 1, we're going to talk very briefly about what is economics and how does it affect the world or your life and everybody's lives. Okay, so let's start with this. Economics is really about uh, politics, it's about the economy, it's about culture and it's also about consumption patterns. However, the study of the economy is a bit more narrower, right? So it is, there is basically five basic elements in this. One, as you know, money. Two, work. Three, technology. Four, international trade. Trade and five, taxes from the government, okay? And about these five elements, how do they actually interact with each other? They interact in three basic areas. One is the production of goods and services. Second, the distribution of incomes and wealth. And three, the, the consumption of goods produced. Now, another way to look at economics is to look and ask four basic questions. And those four basic questions are about money. Uh, put in the most simplistic way, if you ask about economy, you, can, you just ask this basic question. How do I make money? The obvious answer is, of course, to get a job and to produce goods and services. How to move and distribute money? For that, we need to understand banking. We need to understand government taxation and government distribution. And then how to spend the money that you made? We'll look at consumption. We'll look at growth and consequences of this consumption. And the fourth, how do you accumulate and lose money? That is really about investing, asset accumulation, growth and deficit. Now, in, in the, another way we look at this is to say, look, for you, a normal human being, right, a middle class person or someone who is normal, so to speak, what are you worried about? Primarily, people who are normal or middle class are looking at issues regarding jobs and pay. They're looking at cost of living and consumption. Now, if we're looking at the, the, the side of the people in power, so the so-called elite rulers, they're looking at things a bit more differently from you. They're looking at ownership. How can they accumulate more money? How can they produce goods and services better and more efficient? They're looking at their banking system, how to you know, get the cheapest loans. And then they're also looking to try to influence government policies, taxation policies, distribution policies. Those are the basic uh, issues that, that uh, when we talk about political economy or we talk about economic overall, that's the interaction of those factors. Now, how, what is the real relationship between normal people and the elite rulers? In basic terms, uh, most academics will say that this is a social contract between the people and the rulers. And what is this real social contract? There's actually three basic things that the government pr promises, the elite rulers promises to the people. One, to provide security and defense from harm from other people. Number two, they're supposed to build infrastructure. Banking is a type of infrastructure. Roads are a basic infrastructure. And the third one is to provide moral compass, whether it's religion, a certain type of culture, a certain type of leadership. Now, those are the three things. That's the social contract. The people get together and support rulers. Rulers, in turn, look after our defenders they are supposed to build infrastructure for us and they are also supposed to lead us morally. Okay? Now, what we're going to do in this lecture series is we're going to look at a few other points. We're going to look at history. We're going to look at how uh, policies can affect you, how to draft policies, and basically what are the core issues you're facing today. Those are coming in the coming lecture series that, is, that, that follows this one. But for now, in this office in particular, we try to teach economic policy making to our interns and to our officers. And for that, you need to understand four basic things again. First, any problem, any policy requires you to understand the problem. So understand the problem means you must be able to look at data and try to decipher what is the real essence of this problem. 
Two, you have to propose a solution. For solution, you can go to a desert island, sit there for 20 days, come up with an idea, or you can talk to your friends, or you can follow what successful countries have done. Three, you have to worry about the budget. To do something, you still need to have money to solve it. So where are you going to find that money? And four, how to implement this solution that you have proposed. And that's basically it. the summarized version of part one, the role of government, the role of economics, the interaction between the rulers and the people, and how do we tackle economic policy issues. That's it. Hi, for Q&A this week, we have five questions prepared by the interns. Press the button, Akhil. Number one, first question, MACC will introduce a module on anti-corruption for Form 5 and later for the university level. I fully support this, but I think they can do much better. In fact, if I'm correct, and this is what was told to me by my uh, Hong Kong friends, in Hong Kong, they train kids as young as seven years old, so like standard one. We can do that. I think that's, that's where we should start. Much, much younger. Number two, uh, there's a executive who says that we need, we need to push up foreign FDI by giving them more uh, tax break. I think this is to do with the automobile industry. My opinion, well, the things that we should do other than tax break, tax break has been here for the longest time, yeah, to attract FDI. What we really need to do is improve democracy and governance rule of law, which is very important for investors. But primarily, we must focus more on DDI, domestic direct investment. Number three, Royal Pahang durian issue. What is the issue here? Now, most of these durian planters are illegal on illegal land. What the state government should have done, Pahang state government should have done, is to deal with them directly, either to legalize their land, ask them to pay a premium or pay the fine, or you know, or even take whatever process. But it should be done between the Pahang government and the uh, durian planters directly not involving a third party whether it's royal or not royal it doesn't matter but to, to uh, give up these rights to these third party companies is not a good thing because there's going to be allegations of bias number four uh, malaysian currency strengthens against the us dollar this has been happening over the period of year but it doesn't mean that the ringgit is stronger per se is that it's just that the us currency has dropped globally because when we compare with the EU, Malaysian Ringgit has not done that well. Lastly, the issue on Slim River, what does, uh, not Slim River, the Slim by election, what implications are there? What is clear is this it appears that Mahathir is no longer popular amongst the Malays, nor the Chinese, nor the Indians. That's why the Party Pajong had only 15% of the vote, or slightly less than that. What it also means is the Barisan National looks stronger, and it, this may not necessarily translate to Persatu's power. We may, in short, have a very sn very quick snap election in the near future. That's it for this week. q and Hi, my name is Jaling Chong and I study biology in Durham University, England. Currently, I'm doing an internship in YB's office during my summer break and I'm very eager to learn about politics and international relations and also about policy making on environmental and economic sustainability. Hi, so uh, my name is Akhil and it is my last day here at the P104. Um, honestly, this internship has been one of the best things that happened to me. Uh, I never felt so fulfilled and captivated by you know learning and by working hard and just by being around the people here, it's not just a YP Wongshan, it's uh, the officers, uh, Alithia and Ivan, as well as the other interns. Um, they have truly made this experience a, a remarkable one for me. Um, I've done quite a number of things in the past um, three months. Uh, I was able to write a policy paper on uh, public expenditure on R&D. Um, YP Wongshan is the chair for the uh, International Relations and Trade Committee. So also I was able to uh, attend uh, several meetings with the officers and uh, boss. Uh, besides that, uh, I did a few well, community work here and there. And all in all, I, it's been a really enjoyable experience. And I would recommend anyone you know, to uh, work for your local MP for a while, just to see what's it like, uh, regardless of your you know, ideology or you know, um, beliefs. So this is me, signing off.